nanohub.org. You can follow along with this presentation using printed slides from the NanoHub. Visit www.nanohub.org and download the PDF file containing the slides for this presentation. Print them out and turn each page when you hear the following sound. Enjoy the show. So in this presentation I will talk about alloy disorder in quantum dots. In the previous lectures you saw alloy disorder in bulk system. Now we're going to try to understand what alloy disorder can do in a small nanoscale device. So again, as a reminder, seen in previous slides, right, we know each atom ought to be described by isolated uh, orbitals that are starting to interact with the other atoms that are around it. And we live in this world of solids where we have transport and connectivity, and we often forget that really the underneath the, uh, the properties we deal with are based on fundamental quantum mechanics. So again, you've seen this in the previous uh, segments of uh, lectures in this series. As we stack together different chains of atoms, we can line them up as yellow and blue, yellow and blue. We have different band offsets. And we draw these offsets as straight lines and we draw them as quantum wells and then we sort of forget about these Coulombic confinement potentials and when we even forget about the atoms and then we say, well, we know how to compute particles in a box. So we compute the eigenstates of a particle in a box, we draw them as straight lines, we forget about atoms and all the details and we do all of our band structure engineering where photon absorption, photon emission and tunneling are important. And we have different devices with detectors, emitters like lasers, and logic and memory. And we get really excited because we really have a plethora of capabilities. Now, the interesting thing happens if you have a, a nanoscale system like this where maybe you have an ABC quantum dot where at A and B you can have an alloy. And we can have compositional alloys where we engineer the dot size and the energy spectrum and we engineer the confinement potential and we do an atomistic simulation where we can include this explicitly. So going back to this chain of blue and yellow atoms, we can ask ourselves, well, if we have an indium arsenide quantum dot of a defined uh, a diameter and height, that kind of makes sense. And we can calculate a typical ground state. And we can now consider a disordered system. What if we had, instead of pure indium arsenide in the quantum dot, we had indium gallium arsenide? We would have a disordered quantum dot. Right? It is randomly disordered. Then, and to make that point clear, we don't have control over the placement of the indium and the gallium. So from sample to sample, we will see something different. Right? It's going to fluctuate. So if we have a randomly placed indium gallium, uh, we would have real alloys that are spatially disordered, and each sample looks differently. So we have different statistical properties. And the typical way this is done uh, in the VCA, the virtual crystal approximation approach, you would average over the indium and the gallium properties. And you kind of create an average atom, indium-gallium, depending on the indium and the gallium concentration. So what you do is you effectively average over blue and yellow and you get green, right? But you get a homogeneous green. There's no more disorder, right? It's, it's a smooth material. You would also neglect effects at the interface, because the interface uh, is actually rugged. Right? If I zoom into, the, say, the top corner, you know the confinement really changes if you have an alloy. It's not a harsh, sharp border. Right? Like we normally draw these stick diagrams and we say, well, there's a barrier material and here's the barrier. That barrier is not vertical, right? It's actually distributed in space. Okay? So that may matter. And if we just do a virtual crystal approximation, we forget all about all of that, right? We suddenly have an almost step-like interface. 
it's still atomistic. It's not exactly a straight line, right? It goes by, into, by atom to atom, but it's at least smooth. All right, so here's the Gedanken experiment. People have built these uh, indium gallium arsenide like dots, and they measure a distribution of the optical line width. So here is a conduction band to valence band transition. That's an interband transition from the conduction band to the valence band. And they measure in their statistical samples line widths. Now in the experiments that were out there when we did this work in 1998-99, uh, there was not a whole lot of control of quantum dot size and shape and order. Okay, So that was all still in the experiment. So there were variation in size and shape and order. But let's do a Gedanken experiment and say, let's assume these experimentalists could figure out how to build exactly quantum dots at the right spot of the right shape with the right number of atoms in it. Right? That's a pretty strong, confined boundary condition, right? And then we ask ourselves, would it matter if, there's fluctuate, if there were fluctuations of the alloy inside, and how strong would these influences be? So it's a Gedanken experiment that you can't really do experimentally, really. So it's a, a, a million atom simulation, roughly, and in the indium and gallium are randomly distributed. And we want to know, is there any significance in our optical line width that we would compute? So the thing to take uh, to, to note is that if you deal with indium gallium arsenide, you think of it as an alloy, and normally you might have argued that, okay, in this alloy, if I ramp up the indium concentration as shown on the bottom right, I would get an, and plot the bond length that I find in my material, that I would get an average bond length as shown in the green line here. That is a straight line from, uh, from the smaller gallium arsenide bond length to the larger indium arsenide bond length. It turns out experimentally it is known and has been measured by Mickelson and Boyce in 1982 that there's actually a bimodal distribution in that alloy. That means the gallium arsenide pairs would like to stay at a gallium arsenide like bond length, as shown in the lower cluster here in the black line from the experimental data, and the indium arsenide-like bonds like to stay at a indium arsenide-like bond length. It's a bimodal bond distribution. So the local neighborhood tries to arrange itself that it looks either, depending if you have an indium involved, it likes to push the arsenics far away that it's its natural indium arsenide bond length. And the gallium pushes the, ac the arsenics around such that it likes to keep them at a certain distance, which is the gallium arsenide bond length. Or you could argue the arsenic atoms are pushing the gallium and indiums around to move at a certain distance where they would like to have them, right? So it's a bimodal distribution. It's not a homogeneous distribution. And the red lines are the and the blue lines are what NEMO gives in a bulk calculation, and the dashed lines around them are the statistical, uh, the sigmas around it. Okay, so we are within a sigma typically of the experiment.